Pearl Harbor happens, and some guy in a financier actually somewhere in southern, in, along the Hudson Valley got to FDR and said, there's, thinking, there's something going on in Germany where they can see things with radio called radar. And nobody in this country knows about radar. We need to bring them up to speed. And so FDR took it at his word and he set up a laboratory at MIT called the Rad Lab, which you probably know about. And companies were invited to send candidates over there to teach, to be taught about radar. It was the best thing, I, I fell right into it because they had assembled at that lab experts from every university in the country came to that one place, established a university devoted to microwaves. And the idea of microwave electronics was absolutely unknown to most people. I mean, 200 megahertz was pretty much out in blue. You spend three weeks or, so, or maybe a month over there and you come back and you continue the work you were doing and then you'd go back after another six months or so as new things developed. I got to go three times, about well, two times at MIT and then they set up another lab at Harvard. You have radar and then you want to have a way to defeat radar called countermeasures and the countermeasures was all done at Harvard so I got, the, I got both ends of it. I got sent over there and that's where I got to meet that was the most dynamic part of my life, actually, over there. It was just one of those gung-ho type places. Everything happened. You'd, you'd come to work in the morning and work until about six, and then you'd, the, the staff would put up the lunch and stay in, and then we'd go to dinner. We'd come back and have lung, lectures after the dinner, and people like Hans Bader. So I learned my, my, my microwave technology right there, and came back and we established a uh, we established a uh, radar system here there were two laboratories in the roof of building 5 wc white was uh, our manager and he was somehow given to fanciful things and he named the two buildings anska and digeny something <laughs> supposedly mohawk indian would number 1 number 2 so on the roof of 5 we had this dish and we would radiate to a reflector out in the Glenville Hills so we could test tubes that were transmitters that were made. We were, they were working on two different things, a microwave magnetron at 3 gigahertz and in a, the, what's called a lighthouse tube. They had to beef up everything, engineering, uh, production, any, every, every function of a company had to be beefed up in a hurry to get things out in a hurry. And the, the word in those days was not how much does it cost, just get it done. We don't care how much it costs. The place that I worked at GE was the generation of, of microwaves. So the two part of it. In addition to high power power amplifier tubes to make better transmitters, they were magnetrons. People were developing tubes that were the detector element on the receivers. And there's a, you probably have maybe some recordings of the ceramic metal envelope tubes that were developed by a guy named Banks. And those were, uh, we knew what had to be done, but ordinary tube manufacturer at the time with glass bulbs and all the rest, you couldn't get the spacing small enough to because of the time of flight of an electron was too long compared to a, a time of a, of a wavelength. He was able to make, his fellow Beck was able to make these miniature tubes that had very low noise, and so the radar receivers were low noise as well as the transmitters were higher power. And the original radar receivers were just a crystal detector. Uh, a sophisticated Christmas, that was a sophisticated, and if you got, there's a fellow, uh, another guy at GE who was developed what they call a TR box, which is the same, uh, except you send out a radar pulse and, and you want to listen right away to see what's coming back. 
and you send out that radar pulse, you better shut off your receiver or you're going to have smashed the receiver. Mm -hmm. So you have what they call a transmit receiver box that's supposed to do that. But it's not perfect. There's a little bit of a spike of energy that comes through and the little diode detectors would burn out. Well, the tubes were robust. They wouldn't burn out. So it made possible a reliable, high-power radar with a good sense of receiver, and the Coral Sea is one big example of what you get, the result you get from it. If you read World War II history, there's a battle called the Battle of the Coral Sea in the Pacific, where the U.S. fleet could see the Japanese fleet over the horizon because they had a powerful radar with uh, we made our receiver had a good old noise figure so you could detect weak signals and they could see the Japanese Navy flotilla and the Navy, the Japanese couldn't see us and so they bombarded the devil out and that killed the whole Japanese Navy right then and there, that one battle. And a key element in that, as I say, was not only did we develop the place that I worked at GE was the generation of, of microwaves. So the tube part of it. In addition to high power power amplifier tubes to make better transmitters, they were magnetrons, people were developing tubes that were the detector element on the receivers. And the other thing it was that the uh, uh, development of tube technology, not only at GE, but GE was big in it. The ceramic metal tubes that could stand mechanical shock, they could be run at high temperatures, you could, you could, mount, a, you could mount a proximity receiver on the nose of a bomb. And uh, a bomb would go down and heat up as it goes through the air. But the electronics didn't mind because they were high power electronics that could stand the temperature. I'm talking now of temperatures of oh, 200, 300 C, something like that, not 1,000 C, but two or 300 C. We, we had a development group that I worked with, which is where Raywall and Wittery were, which is in that building 37. It was, it was called an electronics laboratory. Later on, there was another electronics laboratory in GE that was established in Syracuse, when, that's later. But we were an, electro, an electronics laboratory that was a spin-off of the research laboratory. We were located in the same building, but uh, because we were so heavily supported by tech, by government contracts, cost control point, separated from the research laboratory. Yes, physically we were in the same building, but uh, in the bookkeeping world, there were two different bookkeepers. So we were called an electronics laboratory. My job, by the way, wasn't to build the tubes. I was a, the person who took the tubes and put them in microwave cavity type circuits. I designed the circuits and the, and the waveguides and stuff like that. But when something had to be then built, they had a production facility right there in the building to take these low noise tubes, for instance, build them, and uh, then in the same NGE plant, down in another building, building 81, is where they built the systems, radar systems, and they would take these things that we built and apply them. In addition to the tubes that we built would be delivered to other Manufacturers, Raytheon was one of the places we sent the tubes to. And in the early part of the war, I'm switching back from the Pacific theater to the European theater now, and the British had been enduring the Battle of London. Uh, they were getting geared up to build radars themselves, and we built a lot of the tubes that were used in their radars in that we'd make tubes in the laboratory now, not in the manufacturing, we'd make them maybe five or 10 of them, and put them on the airplane and fly them right on over to London and put right in the system. They never got to a warehouse or anything like that. It was just direct application. 
which made the people who did the work feel good because they were contributing. It wasn't something that just sat there and didn't do anything. And so uh, uh, another big advantage that we had is we were able to go to higher frequencies now. We went up from a gigahertz to three gigahertz where the wavelength is short enough so the resolution of the things you could see were smaller. And what we could see would be the submarines, the German submarines that were sinking our supply ships that we sent from here to buffer up the British. And the three gigahertz radars could see those kind towers sticking up and they were able to disrupt that submarine warfare thing. And the tubes that were used in those radars were lots of them made here in Schenectady. That was another dynamic thing. And uh, then as time went on, uh, we went higher and higher in frequencies. We went from 3 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, and then the highest we ever went to was 24 gigahertz, one centimeter wavelength. And uh, uh, as I said, the, the uh, initiation of some of that higher frequency work was over there again at the MIT lab, and as they developed higher and higher things, people would get sent back from here to there to learn about it. Well, it primarily was on the radar because that, that was being, being developed while, while I was in, in school and, and I, I worked at the, where the radar was being developed. I, I, what, what I remember was uh, on, on Building 30, where the Ordnance Department was, mm -hmm. there was a balcony out there. Mm -hmm. And I remember being out on the balcony with my automatic control, which, yeah. And then we would have planes come flying down the railroad, and we would uh, then use track the, the planes from, from the, the roof. And we would count canoes on the Charles River, and that would be our, our target. <laughs> I don't know whether you've ever done a segment on Jim Lawson, who worked for GE for a while. He was a hotshot guy at the Rad Lab, and he had what they called the gold-plated radar system. Everything that was, the newest thing that had been developed at, the, at that laboratory was installed in a radar system that Jim Lawson managed. Again, I got involved with, with that as time went on, higher and higher frequencies, and uh, higher power at higher frequencies. Uh, when we, we were talking now of pulse tubes, this is not continuous power, but pulse tubes where we could make 20 megawatts of power peak for a microsecond at 10 gigahertz, and that made a very nice radar. You can see things with that. This is a magnetron that was designed 1943, 24 gigahertz, one of the first 24 gigahertz magnetrons for pulsed radar. And it was the first design in which the magnets were built inside the shell of the magnetron itself to avoid having the magnets become demagnetized if somebody would knock metal against them. The design never went commercially because it was too expensive, but as time goes on and we develop microwave ovens and we use the same frequency now, 24 gigahertz, and we are using, instead of a pulse, to make a high peak power, a continuous wave to make high average power for microwave heating. We have a magnetron here that puts out the same average power as this was putting out. Much lighter, the advent of new materials like ferrites makes the magnets much smaller and they are shelled in a shell that protects them. And so we have a tube which is lower cost, lighter weight, widely used in microwave ovens. This thing was a initial design that didn't end up being more than a demonstration of potential capabilities.